Shakespeare in The Merry Wives of Windsor said, better three hours too soon than a minute too late. But if, but if I'd been three hours too soon in my flight from Vancouver to Seoul on December 10th, 2010, I would have missed seeing this eruption of the Kizaman volcano on Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia. So I'm going to talk about time today. Time is the most common noun in the English language, according to the Oxford English Dictionary. Time is a rather mysterious subject, and so I want to talk different things about time. So nearly 2,000 years, St. Augustine wrote that, then what is time? If no one asks me, I know what it is. But if I wish to explain it to him who asked, I do not know. So I want to start off by giving a little bit about some artistic and philosophical and historical views of time. And then I want to focus a little about the history of the concept of time in, in physics, which is my own subject. <clears throat> so artistic views of <clears throat> time, there's uh, Seneca lived at the same time as Jesus Christ, said it's not that we have little time but more that we waste a great deal of it. And then more recently, C.S. Lewis has said, the future is something which everyone reaches at the rate of 60 minutes an hour, whatever he does, wherever he is. So historical views of time, there's two sort of main categories. There's a cyclical view that things repeat. And of course, we know that from the day that they, the, as the Earth, now as we view it, the Earth rotating around, the sun appears to rise and, and set once each, once each day. And then, of course, the moon, you go from new moon to full moon back to new moon, and that's once in what we might call a month. And then, of course, the year, as the seasons change uh, over the period of about 365 days. So this has led to some cyclical views. Uh, <clears throat> and in fact, people combine a lot of these, this is Hipparchus, who lived about, who lived uh, 2,200 years ago, 22 centuries ago, and one of, the, one of the greatest ancient astronomers. And he combined some of the things, and <clears throat> he noted that that's 3,760 months, or that is new moons, is very nearly the same as 111,035 days. That's, that's just about, that's within a day or so of, of 304 years. But anyway, the days, that match was off by only about 52 minutes. So that's, it was off by only about one part in three million. So can you imagine? These people 2,200 years ago got things right within one part in three million, an error of very tiny. So there was this, these cycles that people had when they almost repeated. It wasn't quite repeating, but almost. And then another is the, the Mayan calendar. That's the 13 Bakhtan cycle. <clears throat> has, I think, 1,872,000 days in, in that cycle. Now, another ancient uh, view, particularly among monotheistic religions of Judaism and Christianity and Islam, is the linear view of time. So from the creation of the, of the world to the present and then to the last, last day. So <clears throat> those are sort of two historical views of time. Now let me turn to some physics views. And here we'll see Galileo, who is often called the father of astronomy and or, and or modern science. He did a whole number of different things. But right now I'm going to talk about his discovery. He was sitting at, a, in a, at the cathedral in Pisa, and he noticed the chandelier was swinging. And he, noticed, he, he timed it with his, his pulse, and he noticed that even when the swings got less, the amplitude got less, it still took the same period, the same time to go from one swing and back again. That was the same whether it was small or whether it was big. And he realized he could use that to time things. Uh, one thing he used it is he, t he would use that to time the pulse of his patient since he was also a physician. He didn't have to rely on his own heart rate, which might depend on his own health. Uh, but then for physics, he, he used it to see how fast things fall. Well, things fall too fast to, even for him to be able to tell how many swings would go if you just dropped it. 
but he realized you could dilute gravity by having things roll down an inclined plane. It would go slower, and so he measured with the pendulum, and he discovered that if it went a certain distance with one swing, after two swings, it would go four times as far, and after three swings, nine times as far, and after four swings, 20, 16 times as far. So in other words, the distance when it's the square of the time. You, you have to take multiply the one second by one to get for the, the distance one unit for one, and then for two seconds is two times two or four, it goes four units, and, and, and nine, and 16, and 25, and so on. Another consequence of that is that the acceleration was constant. That is, the speed was increasing at the same rate for each second. And we now know if you drop something vertically, we can measure it. It's a, after one second, it's going almost 10 meters per second. After two seconds, it's going about 20 meters per second, and, 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 and so on. So, so this was then, you became kind of a forerunner for Isaac Newton's laws of mechanics, one of which was uh, F equals MA. How many people have heard of that formula, F equals MA? Okay, so anyway, it's one we study in physics, means force is equal to mass times acceleration, and if you take that the gravitational force is proportional to the mass, it gives a constant acceleration for gravity. No matter what you have, it'll fall at the same acceleration. So if I drop these two things, then ignoring air friction, they would hit the ground the same, but I, I think maybe I'd better not. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so now Newton's view, he viewed time, he had a view of time as something outside of matter, that it was, he said, absolute, true, and mathematical time of itself and from its own <coughs> nature flows equably without regard to anything external. So the time was something independent, right? independent of things going on within the unit. So that was the view in Newtonian mechanics. Now later, I'm going to skip ahead until the early 20th century, then when <clears throat> the theory of special relativity was developed by a combination of many people, of which Einstein was probably the, the most prominent. And in that, it was found that how much time elapses depends upon the speed of the observer. It doesn't make much difference if you just go at ordinary human speeds, but if you go comparable to the speed of light, it does make a difference. And if you're going faster, the time, your clocks run slower. And so time became relative, but then Hermann Minkowski, the, per, the person here on, the, uh, on this side, <coughs> combined time with space into what he called space-time, and he wrote then that hence space by itself and time by itself are <coughs> doomed to fade away into mere shadows, and only a union of the two will preserve an independent reality. So time became relative, but space also became relative. But this union in space-time was still an absolute background in this theory. It was still something that everything was moving within this, this background, space-time, uh, <laughs> without affecting it. That was in special relativity of 1905. But then Einstein went, worked for 10 more years on develop, putting gravity into this framework. And this he achieved in his theory of general relativity, which he achieved almost entirely by himself. So although, you know, he should give the major credit, but not nearly all of the credit for special relativity, for what happens if you move fast, for his theory of gravity, he should be given almost all of the, all of the, the, the credit. So now I wish to describe a way of describing general relativity and the effect it has by John Wheeler, who is a later expert on, on general relativity. And so Wheeler simply described Einstein's theory in two sentences, that space-time tells matter how to move, matter tells space-time how to curve. So the first part is saying that the matter, <laughs> if you have a small object with no non-gravitational forces on, like if something's just falling freely, uh, again, I won't drop it, uh, if it's falling freely, it moves in what we call a geodesic of space-time. That's the nearest thing to a straight line. Or if you have the surface of the Earth, if it's, you idealize it as a sphere, the nearest thing to a straight line is a great circle. It's the shortest route between two points. Anyway, in space-time, there are analogous things that are like straight lines uh, in the curved space-time, they're GD6, and that's how small objects move when there's no non-gravitational forces on them. But then the other side of it is that the matter tells the space-time how to curve. So part of the curvature of 
space time is, equa is equated to what's called the stress energy tensor of the matter. It's about relates the energy densities and pressures and so on for the matter. I won't get into the math of that. But the matter affects the curvature of space time. And so therefore, it's that now we're actually making space time itself dynamical. It depends, it changes with time, it evolves. And so the time itself is sort of evolving in a way that depends on the matter in it. Okay, now so far I've talked about uh, what we call classical theories, uh, Newtonian mechanics, special relativity, and general relativity. Those are theories in which particles or small objects have definite positions and velocities, that, or the center, you might say the center of mass of a small object. It's point, it, you, it has a definite position and velocity. But in, in the early 20th century, it was discovered that that's not really so, that we need to describe matter by quantum mechanics, and it's, it's particularly evident for small things like atoms, that there's the uncertainty principle. We can't say where something is precisely and how fast it's moving. So instead of describing motion of, of small objects or particles by definite trajectories through space-time, by definite positions at each time, were described by a wave function. Now, I won't be able to describe that in detail, but let me just say it's, it's something, if it's in a background space-time, it depends on both the time and the space. And this wave function evolved deterministically. There's a definite equation for it called the Schrodinger equation. Or how does it change with time? But now that, that leaves the background still classical. The space-time, we're ignoring the quantum uncertainty principle for that. So if we go to the next stage, we try to apply quantum theory to the gravitational field, then <clears throat> the time not only is a dynamical, it also because uncertainty is in it. And in fact, if you, if you apply this to a, a finite-sized universe, a universe that maybe comes back on itself after a certain distance, you find that in quantum gravity, the wave function doesn't depend on any time. There's no time dependence. It just depends, it just depends on the spatial configuration, how, what the gravitational field is like and where, what the configuration is of the particles and fields. So it doesn't depend on time. Time seems to have disappeared. And there's a lot of talk about the problem of time. So <clears throat> Bill Wooders and I wrote a paper called Evolution Without Evolution dynamics described by stationary observables, in which we point out even though the wave function doesn't depend on time, it can give a relationship between, say, clock readings and something else, like a, some particle moving. And that relationship between one part of the universe and another part can, can, it can be analogous to the time evolution. So, <clears throat> We were saying instead of, we can't say, we can't use T, physicists often use a lowercase t for time. T, t equals zero for the Big Bang, the beginning of the universe, and T equals 14 billion years for now and so on. But we can't give a definite T for each thing. We can't, <clears throat> we can't say it's T equals 12, but we can say it's 12 o'clock, which literally means 12 of the clock. When the clock strikes 12, something else may happen. When the, when the clock strikes, whatever, it's about 2.30 uh, p.m., then I'm standing up here, up here speaking. So, okay, so in that sense, even though time has disappeared from the formalism, there's still something like dynamics. So, okay, so in conclusion about the physicist's view of time, we've gone from Newtonian mechanics, where there was an absolute time not affected by anything else and, not, and the same for everybody, then we went to special relativity, in which the time depends upon the motion of the observer, but there's still an absolute space time, of which time is sort of a part. And then we went to dynamical, uh, <clears throat> dynamical space times for general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity, where it, it depends on the matter. Then we went to quantum, quantum mechanics, in which we can't have definite trajectories, we have the uncertainty principle, and then finally to quantum gravity where there may need be no time. So, so I might take from this that perhaps time itself is not real, but the illusion of time is real. So our thoughts about it really exist, and this apparent dependence of things on the clock time really exists, 
but maybe it's an illusion that there really is a, a, a time, an underlying time behind that. So if we go back to St. Augustine's quote, he's asked, what then is time? If no one asks me, I know what it is. If I wish to explain it to him who asks, I do not know. Well, even when I don't attempt to explain it, I don't want to know what it is. And no one really knows what it is or what it is not. But <clears throat> I hope at least that I've explained a little bit of some of the things that physicists have, have thought about time in the, in the last few decades in the limited time I have. So thanks for the time for listening for me.